Stuart Diver is one of the most positive people you could ever meet. Yet the sole survivor of the Threadbow disaster has endured more suffering than many of us could bear to imagine. It's 20 years this month since he was entombed by a landslide that tore through the Alpine village, killing his wife Sally and 17 others. For three terrifying days, he clung on in sub-zero temperatures, buried by an avalanche of rubble and mud. His rescue was an extraordinary accomplishment amid catastrophic loss. In the years that followed, Stuart Diver rebuilt his life and found new love. But once again, his resilience was to be tested in the most heartbreaking way. It's almost like a form of meditation when you're trudging up a hill. You don't think about anything else. It just clears your mind. And you know, for me, it really does prepare me then to just get back into the real world. Stuart Diver is a mountain man, a man who's always hated being confined to small spaces. It's here, soaking up the valleys and peaks of Kosciuszko, that he soothes his soul and reflects on a life he considers lucky. You've said to me a few times now that you are at your most content and most happy. How could that be after everything you've been through? Because I think that's the only way you can look at life. I mean, you can sit here and be miserable and, you know, say, poor me, look what I've been through. But at some point, you have to make a decision that I am going to live life. And, you know, I'm only 47, so I've got a long way to go and I want to make sure it's the most positive experience I can have. It was midwinter, nearly midnight, on Wednesday, July 30th, 1997. 19 people including young couple Stuart and Sally Diver, were where they should have been safest, at home in the Bimberdeen and Corinna Lodges at Threadbow. There was this roar, that it just like an express train or a jet fighter going low and quickly overhead. Part of the Alpine Way had given way, triggered by leaking water mains. A desperate search for 20 people after a landslide buries two ski lodges in the Snowy Mountains village of Threadbow. It was horrific. The collapsing road caused a landslide that swept away the two ski lodges, burying those sleeping inside beneath tons of concrete and mud. They can hear people calling out. Unfortunately, they can't get to them. and They don't really know where they are. It, um, it doesn't look very good. Yeah, it was terrifying because you've got no idea what's going on. Gone to bed. Yep. And yeah, then I mean, you wake up with what's going on around you. There was about 8,500 tonnes that came down uh, on top of uh, all of us. Um, I was on my back uh, in bed and by the time it had all collapsed down and moved, I had a space maybe two to three inches above my mouth um, and that was it. The next 90 seconds are the longest in Stuart's life. His tiny space is pitch black, but he can feel Sally by his side. Unlike him, she is pinned by their bedhead and can't move. And then he feels the rushing, unstoppable, freezing water. As painful as it is to recount, but um, Sally was aware of what was going on. She, she yeah, hundred percent. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And then obviously, when the water came down, then you know, she started screaming, and you know, and I tried to stop the water uh, going into her mouth, and I couldn't do it. Yeah, and it's one of those things, you know. You've, uh, you know, I, I, I look back on it, and people go, you know, that must be. Yeah, it's unbelievably traumatic. And at the time, it was, and after it, it was. But you know, when I look back at it now, you know, in the most stressful point in my life. Sure, I tried to keep myself alive, because that's what humans do, but I also tried to keep the person I loved the most in the world alive. Yeah, you, you understand that you did everything you could. There, yep. there was no more to yeah, do. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And so, and therefore, and then, you know, obviously then once Sally was dead, then I had to focus on, you know, me and my survival, and basically that's what went on for the next 65 hours. In the following hour, the water would threaten to drown Stuart 
another four times as it gushed down the mountain. Above ground, Stuart's brother Ewan, then a Threadbow firefighter, was one of the first on the devastated scene. I guess it really dawned on me at dawn because, you know, the collapse happened, what, 11.30 at night, and it was only sort of the next morning that uh, I went around to the top of the site and looked down, and, uh, yeah, it was just, yeah, just amazing. And, you and it was your hope, wasn't it, that your brother wasn't there, that yeah, for some I, reason he wasn't there? That yeah, night. absolutely. I, um, I remember looking to where Stu and Sal normally park their car and uh, looked down in the car park and, yeah, crap, it's there. As time ticks by, is there much hope? We must always hold out some hope, but, uh, but it is a very grim situation up there. Despite the fact that there was no good news for so long, you guys kept working yeah. and working and working. We wait till everyone's accounted for before we make the hard line decision. In those days, Paul Featherston was a paramedic Paul on the other side of me. who headed the Special Casualty Access Team. Yeah, thanks, Chris, and if you can just uh, hold everyone in position, uh, I'll be with you shortly. Like all the rescue services, he arrived to a village in mourning. Paul, though, was not about to give up, even as the hours of searching mounted into days. We're all up here, yes, with that little flicker of hope that, you know, we're, we're going to find somebody and uh, it'll be successful. But in his tomb-like space, Stuart was struggling. I had a really big feeling that I needed to get out to tell Sally's mum and dad about what had happened to Sally, because no, otherwise no one else would know what went on. But emo emotionally and physically, was it a hard choice to want to survive? I mean, would death have been more comforting. Oh, 100%. I mean, there were a couple of times there where, you know, we definitely thought about taking my own life, but I had, didn't have the means to do it. So oh, you yeah, tried? No, yeah, absolutely. But, you know, it was, you know, to try and hyperventilate my way to unconsciousness so hopefully the cold would take me. Probably not the smartest idea I ever had. But, you know, I tried because it just got so brutally hard. But the human mind's an amazing thing and it just turned it around and said, no, no, actually, you're not ready to go. Adding to the torment, Stuart could hear the rescuers above him come and then go as further slippages repeatedly stopped their searching. I'm thinking, like, how long can it take, you know, seriously? And then I started to think, well, maybe it's not just this building and maybe something's happened to the whole of Threbo or maybe something's happened to the whole world. I mean, you'd been trying to make yourself heard. Yes, I'd yeah, absolutely, yeah. The yelling out one was an interesting one because I did yell a lot initially and then... I sort of had this thought in the back of my mind that I didn't want to, for some reason, I didn't want to scare Sally. And so I don't think I yelled that loudly, but if I heard noise come closer, I would definitely try and make myself heard. But it wasn't until that 54 hour mark that I could hear a clear you know, voice from the rescuers above is when I went, hey, there, there we go. You know, someone's here, finally. Someone's here. here. And then, um, yeah, I mean, that was an amazing feeling. For all of Stuart's understatement, it was a miracle. We have located definite signs that somebody's alive under the site. The unbelievable has happened. Muffled sounds heard from beneath the rubble here at Threadbow. Despite the days, despite the cold, on Saturday, August 2nd, at 5.37 a.m., they'd found him. For the last three days, rescuers have been digging for survivors. Until this morning, the chances of finding anyone alive were described as remote. 20 years on, few can forget that moment when a lone voice was heard beneath the rubble. After two and a half days of nothing, it was a moment of incredulous joy. They'd actually found someone alive. The uh, New South Wales Fire Brigade officers called out, can anybody hear me? The words came back, I can hear you. They were the first words that we had. And that happened to be Stuart. And of course, you know, everyone's morale went up sky high that maybe we, there's a chance we could do some good, you know. For the next 11 hours, Paul would be Stuart's main contact, his lifeline. As the world impatiently watched on, the most painstaking and precise rescue was taking place. Under the threat of more landslips, it would take hours to find Stuart's exact location. More time still to cut through the slabs to reach his concrete coffin. Even though he had now been found, how high was Stuart's risk of dying? It had to be critical, you know, because it was freezing cold. You had hardly any clothes. 
he was hypothermic, you know, and he had frostbite. So all those things put together over a long protracted time means you are very vulnerable. The next 11 hours were equally as horrific <laughs> as the first, you know, 54 hours because it probably lifted me to a point of, all right, I'm out in 10 minutes. I didn't realise it was going to be another 11 hours before I got out. Here's, here's to you, mate. Good to yeah. see you. Yeah, here's to you. Yeah, no, good to see cheers. you guys together. Yeah, yeah. It's been mm. a... Above ground. Mm. Yeah, it's been a while. We, we've been d doing this day for about, what, 20 years now? Mm. And for 20 years, Stuart Diver and Paul Featherston have shared the unique bond of rescuer and survivor. You know, survival is one thing. Not going mad is another. How do you know I'm not mad? <laughs> I'm, a, I'm just being nice. I've been, I've been <laughs> pretending for 20 years. <laughs> no, the person that stopped me going mad was Feathers, 100%, and that's it. He looked after me. He, his only priority was not him, it was me, and he just wanted to get me out alive. You know, someone stuck in those places, you know, for that long, going through what he did, he's, he's a genius. You know? mm, like, he's Superman. Great peril to the rescuers. They have tunnelled under that slab. With all eyes on Threadbow... We are about to see him here. ..at 5.17pm... This is Stuart Diver. This is the sole survivor of the Threadbow disaster so far. So far. Stuart was finally brought out from the rubble. Yeah, there's the chair. There's the chair going up. They suddenly realised that they know that he's out. It was an absolute roar went up from everybody that was on that site. And I dare say that the whole of Australia remembers that moment. Mm. Yeah, sends a chill up my spine still thinking about that. Could you hear the reaction from the people around Threadbow when you were finally released? Yeah, absolutely. It's the, the one defining thing that sticks with me now. You know, it's always tinged with the sadness of losing Sally and, um, and all of the other people who were, who were in that building, but that moment of elation was my probably my one selfish bit where that was that cheer was about me and about me living and that stayed with me forever seeing the mountains from this view what is your favorite part of it i think it's just the absolute vastness of the open space you know it's just spectacular to see from from up in the air there was a time there when Stuart never expected to see his beloved mountains again. Is that really the case, that you've skied almost every nook and cranny of Mount Cozzi? Skied it, walked it, it's part of me. As a child, Stuart and his family took long treks in the Himalayas, as well as here at Mount Kosciuszko. Here we are. The top. Yay. Gotta touch it. Gotta touch it. <laughs> That's right. Always. Doesn't matter how many times you've been here. No. You've always got to touch the top. It was carting camping equipment and enduring chilly overnight stays that Stuart believes prepared him for the ordeal of the Threadbow landslide years later. So, so you were toughened up as a youngster? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that physical uh, part definitely would have made me a lot more resilient. So when I was put under, you know, obviously that extreme cold and that extreme pressure, I knew that my body would be able to, you know, at least last as long as it did. All the people who have given me so much support over the last couple of days, um, it's been overwhelming and I don't think I would have uh, made it through without the involvement of all those people. It's been fantastic. In the early months after his rescue, Stuart had to deal with his intense grief in the media spotlight, but always in the care of the Threadbow community. They would keep checks on me and make sure I wasn't just going out every night getting blind drunk and doing whatever, so... And were you doing that? Were you going absolutely. and getting blind drunk? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I tried to do, you know, in those initial days, I went out every night and drank and, you know, partied on and, you know, thought it was, um, you know, I was going to be a 27-year-old male who could just deal with anything. But, you know, it gets to a point where, uh, luckily, um, I realised that I couldn't. You keep your eyes closed. And so Stuart turned to professionals and family for help. So your role as somebody who knows him best is to see the worst. Mm, that's right. How bad did it get? Um, I got pretty low. I don't cry all that often, but I did cry a couple of times. Yeah, it's definitely, uh, definitely a lot of work, a lot of work in it. Mm. And how's he doing now? Um, have a look at him. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's right. I mean, technically he's my boss at work, so, <laughs> so he's nice. going great. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> 
There was an old lady who swallowed her. Corn. She swallowed the corn to ride the seahorse. Saturday her. morning in the and diver household is daddy daughter time for Stuart and Alessia. There was an old lady who swallowed a whale. whale. <laughs> Like most six and a half year olds. Get out of the cupboard, you monkey. Alessia is spunky and spirited. Let it go. <laughs> Did you get one? Especially when it comes to sneaking lollies. Shocker. <laughs> See, master disciplinarian <laughs> has it all wired. <laughs> this is a little girl who likes cartwheels. <laughs> I'll pick a card and. And card tricks. Put it back in. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is your card? Yes! How did you do that? Magic. Oh, magic. All right, here we go. Done. Right, she go. also loves making pancakes from her mother's recipe book. How much butter do we need, Muncho? No doubt, Muncho, as he calls her, has stolen Stuart's heart. How do you rate them out of 10, just for look? 140 out of 10. Well done, Dad. <laughs> and she's a pretty amazing little girl. She has a real understanding and a real empathy and a compassion that I haven't seen in a lot of kids that age, purely because I believe you know, what she's been through. She is key to where I am right now. Alessia's birth in 2010 added a joyful and extraordinary chapter to the life of a man who over the past 20 years has suffered inconceivable loss, not once, but twice. You sometimes get to that point where you think, you know, we like, can I love again? You know, and you go through something so emotional and the loss is so big, you, you do really think in the back of your mind, maybe, maybe I've used up all of that and I'm done. But in 1999, Stuart did find love again. It was two years after the landslide killed 18 people, including Stuart's wife, Sally. Threadbow local, Rosanna Cossettini, showed the 29-year-old he could be happy again. When you go through something major, you have to get to a point where you draw a line in the sand and you say, that was my life with Sally, and so therefore, um, what am I going to do? Well, I had a, a wonderful marriage to her, short marriage, but it was a great relationship and we did some amazing things, so why wouldn't I want to recreate that again? And how elated were you to get a second chance? Yeah, it's unbelievable. I mean, I never ever thought, I always thought that Rosanna was way too good for me. So and, <laughs> She probably was. Yeah, that's right, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> that is, that's my life story. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, and it, so I was amazed that she even went out with me. Three years into their relationship, Stuart and Rosanna married and planned to start a family almost immediately. She was uh, you know, loving and caring and looked after me, which was you know, exactly what I needed at that point in my life. And then you had to look after her. Yes. How, how, um, how soon after you got married did you find out that she was sick? Basically the week after we got back from our honeymoon. Rosanna was diagnosed with breast cancer. It was devastating news Stuart shared with his brother. The first person I called Ewan and I'm just bawling my eyes out on the phone and just going like, what the fuck is going on here? When you got that phone call mm. from Stuart, how did you react? Um, oh crap, <laughs> yeah, a few tears at that time and then uh, we just put on the, uh, the stoic Scottish <laughs> attitude of, oh well, let's, uh, let's, get, let's get going, it's, what can we do? It is what it is. Um, and we'll just have to deal with it as we, as we roll. Yeah, you describe yourself as a stoic Scotsman. Are you ever angry, Scotsman? Um, on the inside. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah. There's the, de de definitely a bit of anger yeah, so in there somewhere, but um, well managed. I mean, everyone feels anger at mm -hmm. something, but it's, you know, it comes back to the same thing. It's how you deal with it. I mean, being on the site, it doesn't feel like 20 years ago, does it? It's no, I mean, so not at all. Um, As we saw with the Threadbow landslide, giving up has never been the dive away. I mean, it's always tinged with a little bit of sadness, but it's uh, definitely um, not something that overwhelms me. You know, I actually like being here. It's pretty peaceful. As he did following his rescue, on Rosanna's diagnosis, Stuart went into survival mode, and so did she. Operation after operation was followed by chemotherapy and radiation. At that 
time, had you given up all hope of having a family? Yeah, I mean, I didn't want to lose another wife. And so, yeah, that, that was really in the back of our minds. But obviously, as you know, the longer she survived and she got healthy again, then we started to think, oh, well, maybe, you know, this is something we could explore again. I always thought, and Rosanna and I spoke about it, that she may die at some point and then I'd be left with Alessia on my own and did we really want that, etc. So there was, a, there was a huge amount of thought that went into it. But try they did. And after one miscarriage, their baby daughter Alessia was conceived. She was 44 years of age when she had Alessia, so pretty amazing story, you know. And that's where, you know, I look at her and what she did in her life. Yeah, it's incredible. Hey. <laughs> Stuart and Alessia lost Rosanna two and a half years ago after the cancer returned. Their grief was made more manageable by family counselling before Rosanna died and a commitment to make every moment count. Pre-grieving for your wife, not knowing when she's going to die, is, is brutally, brutally hard, and especially when you're involving a four-and-a-half-year-old in it. But Rosanna had said, I'm going to share every day I can with Alessia. And so and I think if you look at Alessia now, that's key, because she knew she was so loved by her mum, and they've locked away so many memories of, you know, sitting on the couch, you know, in this house and cuddling. And that's, you know, it's as simple now as all I need to do is cuddle her, and that's it because that just brings back the beautiful memories of being snuggled into her mum and being loved. It's as simple as that. In the lead up to her death, Rosanna made sure Alessia would always feel loved by her. She packed away special clothes and jewellery in a chest for her daughter, wrote her birthday cards for years into the future and collected favourite recipes they'd made together. To be able to have that there for Alessia, I think, was a huge thing for Rosanna to do and really did comfort her, you know, especially in those last couple of weeks. Mm. I know the questions that you had about raising a child on your own, where are those questions now? Well, they're gone because it's the most awesome thing ever. You know, it's, just, it's, it's great. I mean, Alessia calls me uh, mum and dad and, you know, so when she wants stuff and she calls me mum, and then <laughs> when she wants to manipulate me, she calls me mum. <laughs> the strength of the man was just unreal. Stuart! Oh, I love it once. It's been a long time. <laughs> Stuart Diver gained many admiring friends as he overcame challenge after challenge. Good luck. One of them is Lieutenant Colonel Don Woodland, now retired from the Salvation Army. And you've been there for every uh, important moment of my life, so which is um, yeah special that's to me, that's which that's is what it's all about. Don was there bedside and incredible support after Stuart was rescued from the landslide. And he led the anguished services at both Sally and Rosanna's funerals. Naturally, it's got to be horrendous to have to walk that pathway twice so soon. You're beautiful. There you go. There you go, gorgeous. You Alyssa go. brings hope. She brings life. You ready to go? And hopefully happiness. All right. Well, Let's get out of here. when you see the two of them together, we're reassured of that. What do you think is the best uh, part of skiing for your daughter? I think it's the freedom it gives you. It's that feeling of being outdoors and doing something that just gives you uh, that, that ultimate freedom. It's not a bad backyard. You ready, Alessia? You ready to get on, Good girl. Good girl. Alessia has skied this winter wonderland since she was two. And while Threadbow posed the okay, greatest on. threat to That's Stuart good. two decades ago, he can't think of a safer place to raise his daughter. It's a little utopia. It's an island in the middle of the big wide world and there's so much adventure and so many friends and fun. It's, yeah, it's awesome. Okay, well Alessia, are you going to go gentle on me down these slopes? Are you going to look after me going down here? You won't go too fast? <laughs> Will you? Try not to. She's making no true commitments. Yeah, yeah that's right. I, know, that's <laughs> I don't right. feel like I'm in safe hands at all. <laughs> Stuart is a former ski instructor and Alessia is already an old hand on the slopes. While it all looks like a play, much of Stuart's approach is about building up his daughter's resilience. 
the truth of it is that's what we need to do. We need to provide a little bit of hardship, whether it's physical, whether it's emotional in some ways, so that kids are prepared for what's going to happen in the future. Now, I'm definitely going to give her the tools to make sure that if anything big does happen in her life, and even if anything small happens in her life, she's, she's got the ability to deal with it. In the early days after the Threadbow landslide, feeling the responsibility of being the sole survivor, Stuart kept his pain private. I pretty well made that decision that anything I did in the public eye, I was going to put a positive spin on it. OK, so what was going on in the private eye? Just crying. I mean, I was in the shower and crying and, you know, doing everything. I mean, it was, it was a hard place to be. Yeah, you were very determined not to cry on TV. Absolutely. And I think in some ways that was detrimental to me because people just thought I was hard in some ways and callous. And, you know, even today it might be, you know, the way I, I talk, you know, openly and honestly about, you know, my two wives dying because, you know, that's what's happened in my life. Now, how I deal with that myself is, is actually a really, really personal thing. And I've spent a lot of time and a lot of effort and put a lot of hard work into that. And I recommend that, you know, anyone who goes through trauma in their life does the same. Hey, man, how are you? Yeah, good, how are you doing? Good, good. all set up? Yeah. Today, Stuart Diver, as operations manager, is second in charge at Threadbow. It's just those ordinary moments. But his greatest success is as a father and as a man who was brave enough to seek help, to learn that trauma does not have to rob you of life. It may be the harder path at times, but we can all choose to be survivors. Have a fun day. You can't look at life any other way. That's it. I mean, there's, you've got a choice, and my choice is look at it in a positive light and sure have your emotional lows and go to those dark places but you know make sure at the end of the day when you go to bed that the last thing you're thinking is you know how bloody lucky am I and um, how great is the world and you know let's move along and um, see what we can achieve tomorrow. And all your hopes alive today. Hello, I'm Tara Brown. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our extra minutes segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.